that's in every uh, people we have following on us and you'll see the the chat uh, mm -hmm. module going up there people can like it you know you'll see little mm -hmm. hearts they can also take screenshots yeah. and stuff too so and the number isn't always accurate so don't be surprised if it's yeah hey there uh thanks for joining us uh we're live from naoc right now so uh, i'm just gonna put up our uh twitter handles real quick so you can uh see who it is you're talking to and follow us on twitter later so i'm wildlife bio gal uh, also known as nicole wood and i'm here with kathleen farley and what are your uh, lovely twitter handles like how we yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so i am at catitarian um so like cat and vegetarian and also at Woodcock Watch New Jersey, my newest handle on Twitter. Yeah, so uh, if you want to be able to watch all of this later, uh, you can go to wildlifebiogal.com. Uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, have links to the Periscope. You'll also have links to uh, YouTube and SoundCloud, which I usually am pretty good with getting those up right away, but because we're in the middle of the conference right now, it might be a little while longer before I get those up. So might even be as late as this weekend before those go up, but I will also make an announcement on Twitter uh, when those are uh, put up and available. So anyways, uh, as we said, we're live from NAOC here at Washington, D.C. So NAOC is the uh, North American Ornithological Conference. It's right? mouthful. Yes, yeah. So it's always hard trying to remember uh, getting that all right. But um, so we're in the middle of the conference right now. There's a whole bunch of talks and everything going on. 14, you uh, know, I think? Something like that. It's crazy. Yeah. There's so many rooms filled with conference uh, talks. Uh, this morning was the first plenary with uh, Jessica Muir, which was absolutely Fantastic. amazing. Yeah. I mean, it was just great. I mean, if you ever want to have a quality uh, uh, plenary speaker, get her to come talk to you, your thing. I mean, she's one, a great biologist. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was some awesome work that she was doing uh, with uh, penguins. And then what was the other bird? It was some the bar headed goose. goose. Yeah, yeah. So it was the goose. Yeah. And it's just like really inspirational, like, you know, not giving up, you know, on your dreams and just keep pushing through until you get to what you want to do. And I think also that your dreams have a funny way of coming true sometimes. Right. Like she wanted to be an astronaut yeah. and instead went to school for biology and mm -hmm. still became an astronaut. Right, exactly. So, and it's just like how, I mean, sometimes you might not think that, you know, a career in uh, ornithology, like, mm -hmm. could relate to being... Uh, NASA scientists, mm -hmm. but it all somehow can like tie into whatever it is you want to do. And so that was really good. Um, there's a lot of great uh, other activities going on. You can go out and bird, where people have been going out exploring Washington, yeah. D.C. Yeah. You know, we went down and saw the White House uh, the other mm -hmm. day, which was a lot of fun. So there's a lot of really great things going on. There's going to be a lot of other really good talks uh, coming on. Hey there. And um, so, yeah, just. Uh, tune in you know we'll keep having more broadcasts there's gonna be a lot of posters tonight which are gonna be really good so I'm excited to see all the student posters that are gonna be up and about but for uh, right now we're gonna to talk to uh, Kathleen about her uh, life in yeah. science so we're gonna talk about some of her academic history where she's been uh, some of the research that she's done and then also a little bit of uh, SciComp so like the things that she likes to do uh, like you know that have uh, influenced her with uh, SciComp so if you guys have any questions while we're talking uh feel free to uh send those in and like you know we want to make this maybe a little bit more discussion based thing especially since we're doing this on the fly right now so um so anyways uh why don't you tell us about your academic background like you know where you went to school you know did you like it what was good about it you know tell us you know a little bit about those universities like you know what their uh biology programs are like okay so, yeah so I guess I should start with saying I'm a cookie, which means I graduated from Cook College at Rutgers University. Cook is the land-grant school. Oh, okay. Um, so it had a mission of really doing the sciences that are about the world and making sure that we care for it in a way that sustains ourselves and other species. Um, so all the programs there, with the exception of a handful, were science-based. We had an um a journalism major and a human ecology, I think, but those were the, you know, least scientific of what we offered, but everything there was science-based and mostly environmental sciences. Okay. Um, so I wasn't actually a bio major, so it feels really weird to be like, hey, I'm a biologist now because my first degree is actually in natural resources and ecology. Um, so there I had, I I'll studied. Real quick, uh, oh. hey there to uh, Berlin, Germany. Mm -hmm. Germany. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Really appreciate it. So you got yeah, we're international the world. Yeah, so. Yeah, so I did take ornithology while I was there. Um, 
but for the most part I felt like I studied more a lot of physical ecology and okay. environmental sciences so the abiotic side of ecosystems. Okay. Um, and from there, I was like, okay, great, I'm done with academia, I'm gonna go to the other side, I'm gonna be a teacher, and so I was actually a science teacher for a number of years, teaching middle school science because I thought really getting a strong foundation in middle school mm -hmm. is what can help make good scientists. And yeah. knowing science literacy is a huge issue in this country, mm -hmm. or the lack thereof, science literacy, that I wanted to help like narrow that gap. So. Right. I actually went and worked in an urban classroom for six years teaching, you know, basic science principles to fifth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders over the six years I was in a classroom. But I wanted a bit more of a challenge, so I decided to go back for my master's. Um, so I did that after two years. So I was working full time and going back to school at night um, at another state school, Montclair State University. Um, which had a biology program, and so I joined there. Did ornithology yet again because you can't get enough birds. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why we're here because yep. you can't get enough birds. 2,000 yeah. people agree. Mm -hmm. um, which apparently it's the largest bird conference ever anywhere, yeah. I think is what they were saying this morning. Yeah. So, I mean, that's crazy. That's, yeah, if you love birds, this is where you should be. Should be, yes. Yeah. Fly here now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, so yeah. yeah. From there, I got a chance to do a little bit more research. Um, I started my own research project um, working with a long-term data set with my advisor, Dr. John Smallwood. Um, and his work was really instrumental in getting the, kest the American kestrel relisted as threatened species in our state. Um, so tell us a little bit about yeah. the, the kestrel. So the American kestrel is the smallest falcon in North America, and they're really good to study um, because they're easy to find because they like nest boxes. So if you put up boxes, the theory is they will come. All right. Um, what has been discovered is they don't come for very long. That they show up the first couple of years, and you look like you're going to get this great study and these great, you know, sample sizes, and then they start disappearing. And it doesn't matter where in the country nest box programs have been started; they all sort of have this, you know, initial increase and then big decrease um, for the remainder of the data collection period for years. So that data set, I think, is like 20, 21 years. And, you know, they're always hovering record low numbers, like 19 out of 100 boxes used, as opposed to, like, the record was, like, 57 in okay. its heyday. So, kestrels are on the decline, and that was some of the work I ended up doing with them, looking at the return rates. And we're just going to give a quick shout mm -hmm. out back to, uh, from Russia there, thanks for wow. joining us, that's great. Uh, so, if you have any questions, uh, anybody out there, uh, feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, we're going to try to make this a little bit more discussion-based. I'll keep asking questions of Kathleen here in the meantime, but yeah, if you have any questions about birds, about uh, Kathleen's uh, work with uh, birds, with uh, casseroles and woodcocks, you know, feel free to ask away if you want to ask any questions about the conference that's going on right now, because we're live from uh, North American Ornithological Conference. It's going to get harder and harder yeah. to get it out by the end of the week. So but anyways, yeah, feel free to ask. So so like with the casserole work, like for those of us, you know, let's just, assume we don't have any uh, oh so we got we got our first question here from uh, Gregory Go so any parasites in nest boxes yeah so that was one of the things I was curious about I didn't look at them directly that was the work of someone else um, in the lab but I was curious if the age of the nest box perhaps had an impact on their usage that if older boxes perhaps were weathering more they were harder to find or parasite accumulation would cause them to be less attractive to the birds coming okay. back. So that was what I was looking to test. Um, we couldn't find any evidence of that. It didn't matter what the age of the box was, if it was a brand new box or if it was an older box. Um, part of that could be because we clean them out every year. Um, but one of the things we know is, you know, the kestrels don't, they don't care. They don't really care about housekeeping whatsoever. Like, they move in, they're like, hey, I can fit, great, I'm in. Like, you know, no <laughs> spring house cleaning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's too early in the season, it's too cold, mm -hmm. but regardless, they weren't really, you know, taking care of them. So okay. the, if they were anticipating older sites perhaps had more parasites, then, you know, they might have been inaccurately, you know, using that information. But okay. It seems much more likely it's just a case of declining numbers. All right. Um, because there was other work done a couple years before that in Canada that showed that kestrels actually preferentially will choose boxes over natural cavities. So okay. they have to have cavities, the holes in trees to nest in. They're not going to be in an open nest, and they can't make themselves. Okay. So they're highly dependent on other species like woodpeckers 
making the holes or people putting up boxes. Okay. Like Bluebirds. Oh, Bluebirds okay. have similar programs. All right. Nice. So, um, so talk to us a little bit about your PhD. So mm-hmm. you said you went to Rutgers for your PhD. Right. How is that? You know, how's your PhD mm-hmm. going? So I finished up at Montclair. Um, I you know, defended the work there. And then about two years later, I am now back in a PhD program. And there, I still am interested in the human bird dynamic. Um, so I'm just working with a different species now. Now it's the American woodcock. Um, I like to describe it as the shorebird that decided to live in the woods <laughs> because it is in Charodiformes. It's a shorebird, um, but most woodcocks actually live in forests. Okay. Um, they have the same probing, you know, mechanism for finding food that you see okay. uh, with the sandpipers and everything mm-hmm. on the beach. But they are shorebird and they get earthworms out of the soil here. Okay. Um, so my work in particular is going to look at their apparent shift in habitat usage from these early successional forests, which would be like fields with shrubs in them. So sort of annoying to walk through, you'll find vines and prickers and things like that, but you can still see, and then you'll have like junipers and things like that, and maybe a couple young trees is the, their ideal habitat. But what we're seeing, at least in New Jersey where I work, which is the most urban state in the US, um, is that they are being found in post-industrial sites. And what I mean by post-industrial sites are sites that have been historically used in some form of industry. It could be quarries, it could be railroads, it could be a chemical plant, something that has had an adverse effect on the environment there. Mm-hmm. You know, it could just be the, there was re- originally no soil. Um, Liberty State Park, which overlooks the Statue of Liberty, is one of our study sites. Mm-hmm. And there, actually, the soil that's there isn't natural whatsoever. It's just fill from when they built out the railroads as okay. they continue to expand to meet the needs of New York and the other areas that New York okay. is connecting to. So it's not natural soil, but it's, you know, just this sludge of, you know, things we wouldn't want to be near. Right. You know, yeah. you go there, you work, you go home and shower immediately mm-hmm. to get it all off your skin. Oh, nice. You know, so we have this understanding and I think it's far from perfect right now, that anything we touch is bad for nature. And what we're seeing from my lab is that may be way too simplistic of an understanding of these systems. Okay. That, you know, in Jurassic Park, you have life will find a way. You know, Jeff Goldblum is all about this. <laughs> yeah. And I think he was really on to something. I always try to use it whenever I can, some yeah. sort of science. Mm-hmm. It's always so perfect, pulling anything basically yeah. from Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. So. That probably had a huge influence on why I'm sitting here today. Right, yeah. Um, but we have seen that wildlife can adapt. You know, we have, you know, my advisor, Klaus Holtzoffel, likes to talk a lot about the attractive nuisance. Oh, okay. That, you know, this area is really attractive, and then it creates problems because all this wildlife moves in, and they're not always the best neighbors. You know, raccoons are really nosy. They get in your garbage. You know, they knock the cans down. They wake you up. Um, so we have these abandoned post-industrial landscapes, that wildlife are beginning to move into. And so my work is looking at the American woodcock as one of these species that's making this decision. So I'm looking at them from an individual sense. Like each individual is choosing to stop in these sites and breed for a season. And I'm curious to know what cost or benefit do they gain from that decision? Okay. And to hopefully build that out to population level to see, you know, as a whole, can this help the species? Right. You know, are these habitats really going to be these great refuges? These mm-hmm. are almost half a million, you know, post-industrial sites throughout the U.S. right now. Right. So, like, oh my God, if we could capitalize on land we've messed up on for mm-hmm. wildlife, you know, we could really turn things around. Yeah, if that's something that they could utilize, even without having to completely get to the point where you're having to restore it, like they're already starting to utilize it before you have to go through and completely, you know, mm-hmm. fix it. That'd be interesting to know. Yeah, for sure. And it depends what you're looking for also. Mm-hmm. Like what you define as your end, you know, goal. Do you want an entirely native system? We haven't figured out yet how to make things entirely natural after we've mucked around in them. Right. You know, so is the next thing just having a biodiverse system. Mm-hmm. Because when you do restoration, it doesn't lead to the high, the greatest biodiversity as it does if you let abandoned areas recover, is what we're seeing. So some of our preliminary work with some of the other people in the lab and our, and our colleagues says, hey, you have this landscape, you messed it up, 
don't go in there and take all the soil out and put in all these plants that we want to be there. We don't understand the scales enough. We don't understand what's happening at the you know microbiotic levels. We don't understand what's happening geologically and hydrologically to reproduce how nature works. Right. So when we try to rebuild it, it's a poor replication of what used to be there. Okay, so we had a, a question, mm -hmm. I think it was from Gregory Go. I'm sorry if mm -hmm. I'm getting the uh, handle wrong, uh, asking if the woodcock populations are declining. Yeah, so they have been a declining species. They've been studied um, through what's called a singing ground survey um, since 1968. And basically, the singing ground surveys are conducted by driving these routes, and you get out and you listen for about you know a couple minutes at each route um, during their courtship display period. So about an hour after sunset every night in the early spring, they will go out and be very active. And their courtship is fantastic. They, you know, walk out of the woods, they have this little waddle, and they go to this clearing, and they start painting. And they gotta make sure, you know, they're in the middle of, you know, their stadium, that everyone hear them. So they turn in a circle, and they paint. And then when they think they have the female's attention, they'll start doing a flight up into the air and they'll start spiraling and you can hear the wind going through their feathers and you can actually tell exactly where in the flight pattern they are based on the sounds. Right. And it's sunset so you get to see maybe one of these if you're really lucky. Right. And so the rest of the detections are all by ear. Okay. And then you hear them plummeting down to the ground mm -hmm. and then they get back down the ground and they paint again from that little circle. And so we know from those records since 1968 all across like eastern north america um into canada that these birds are declining okay. um they're declining about two percent per year oh wow that's yeah that's mm -hmm. definitely a good drop there you know but um, despite the fact that they're declining right. they're not actually listed as a threatened species or a species of concern anywhere in part because they're a game bird species oh, okay Gotcha. So anyways, uh, we had a question out there asking mm -hmm. what we're uh, discussing right now. So uh, we're discussing uh, Kathleen's work with her PhD. Uh, she's studying the American woodcock. Uh, she goes to school at uh, Rutgers University. And mm -hmm. I know that there was another question out there that I uh, missed in the uh, mix of mm -hmm. everything. So if you want to uh, resend that uh, question, I think it was something about the industrial uh, sites. So mm -hmm. if you could resend that question, we'll try to get that answer because we missed it. I uh, apologize for that. Um, but yeah, so what can you tell us, like, I've, I've seen the videos of the woodcock dance mm -hmm. and I, I loved it when yeah. uh, my advisor, who he teaches a wildlife ecology class, he would make his uh, undergrads mm -hmm. in that class do the fun dance and it's like just like this weird kind of like bobbing of their yeah. heads and it's like a separate of their body. Mm -hmm. If you guys ever get a chance, go out to YouTube and like watch the videos of these woodcocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a fun sight to see. Yeah. So the dance, like... Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Like, Well, I don't know too much about it okay. because that's one of the big mysteries, I guess, with woodcock. Oh, okay. Um, they are a funny little bird, and they have this, you know, their head really stays stationary as their body sort of juts forward, and they actually do that. Not, It's not courtship. It's actually feeding, they think. So oh, okay. it's about trying to perhaps have their feet sound maybe like raindrops on the soil and to sort of cause the earthworms to come up. These earthworms will rise out of the soil to avoid the flooding um, from rainstorms. Okay. So that's one of the you know, suggestions for the behavior. But one of the things they actually don't know is how woodcock sense their food. Do they smell it? Do they feel the vibrations? Do they see the soil moving? So that's been a question that's been in the literature for years. Uh, and I think people are just starting to take another look at it. Um, you know, it's one of the things that I'm potentially going to look at for one of the chapters of my dissertation. You know, okay. see what's actually out there. And now that we have all this, you know, awesome technology and we're really doing more work with physiology and birds in the wild, you know, see maybe if I can incorporate that in because I want to, you know, diversify my skill set now that I'm school, in school again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we got the question back here. And I think uh, if I uh, read it right, um, it was asking if the uh, lack of competition or maybe the uh, lack of predators is what's driving these uh, birds to those industrial sites. Mm -hmm. like, so are there are a lot of predators there that are yeah. preying on it or maybe it's just because they're overabundant in some spots that they're now going to these spots because there's you know no other woodcocks there so they yeah. have plenty of you know room there to yeah. feed. So These questions are all the questions I've been asking myself the last six months or so as I've been okay. putting this project together so I'm glad to know I'm not alone with what I'm curious about. Um, I had the same thought about predators, that okay. maybe these were refuges. Mm -hmm. um, and then I read about what's called the safe nesting zone hypothesis. Okay. 
and that was to suggest that it was safer for birds to nest near people okay. because it would scare other predators away. That makes sense, um, yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot yeah. of sense. But the couple papers that I've read mm -hmm. say maybe not so much. Okay. Because we also have um, mesopredator release mm -hmm. that due to the huge impacts we have had on ecosystems, that habitat loss, we, we lose our keystone predators, coupled with a fear of them. We are terrified of having lynxes in our backyard in the UK, mm -hmm. of mountain lions and wolves here in the US. Right. So we have intentionally changed our food systems here so that those keystone predators are gone, which means the next level predators have no check on them. So their numbers are expanding. So we see a huge increase in raccoons and other species. Um, you know, cats are another one that you, you know, both those species love living near people. They love the garbage cans, they love the food right. scraps, they love the people. And so how would birds really be benefited living closer to people if the predators they're also going to go after the nestlings mm -hmm. are encouraged to live near people? So uh, what are the predators of the woodcock? It depends on the gender of the woodcock. Okay. Um, so, which is really weird when you think yeah. about it. Um, but it's because it's based on behavior. Okay. So males, because they have this aerial flight display to get the female, and you know they're only thinking one thing in the spring. Right. You know they're not paying attention to who else is around, so they are much more likely to be preyed upon by raptors, whether it's a hawk or an owl. Whereas the females, who are down on the ground hiding with their ground nests, okay. are much more likely to be consumed by mammals. Oh, okay. So like. Just any like weasels, you know, would yeah. they feed on them? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, like weasels, I'm trying to think like the size of the woodcock, you know, so, like what would be fox, feeding on them? Coyote, okay. cat, you know, quite just a bunch. Just all yeah. of those like, you know, mm -hmm. medium sized small predators or what are gonna be yeah. feeding on them. It's a great who done it that okay. I'm gonna take you know, investigate as oh, I, neat. you know, go into the next couple of years of the study. Cool. So you've also done a lot of education stuff because mm -hmm. as you were saying, uh, you uh, in a middle school for a while like how do you think that's helped prep you getting back into academia and getting into your PhD yeah that is a great question um, one of the things I really am interested in is education science education and I think really what the average person and the non-average person do what we all do with science and how we perceive it mm -hmm. um, so when people say like oh I have a non-majors class to teach I'm like oh awesome please let me teach that I love the non-majors um, because their views are just so different than people are already in the you know science mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we really do a disservice to ourselves when we disconnect from that. Right. Um, so as a K through 12 teacher, um, my certification um, is from the state. I have a certificate that I graduated um, with from Rutgers for teaching science. And I have certification at the state level mm -hmm. for K through 12 biology, and I've taught you know, in the state and had all the professional development that my school went through. So best practices of teaching were really reinforced. You know, what research says, you know, helps students to learn. Mm -hmm. And that's really missing right now from college teaching. It's beginning to get a foothold in. Okay. I think especially as we're seeing turnover in mm -hmm. what the faculty composition is. For it. Um, but really that big step away from the professor stands there and delivers the material in a lecture format mm -hmm. and the students are responsible for absorbing it all. We're seeing that disappear. Right. And the practices that are being practices from K through 12 you okay. know, sciences and other classes. So I think having that experience really has helped me, you know, better work with my students in the classroom and help them learn. And, you know, to understand that, you know, we're all responsible for learning. It's not them, it's not me, but it's the collaboration. Okay. Um, so we had a quick question here that I'm mm -hmm. just going to jump back to some okay. of the Woodcock stuff. So, like, they were asking, I would assume you're asking, mm -hmm. do cats and dogs also uh, prey on the Woodcock? So I think that's where the question was going, so. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things that I've noticed um, from my own experiences. Uh, I've also worked at nature centers where people think it's a great place, bring your dog. Um, and unfortunately, dogs and cats don't play well as wildlife. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a big issue in the United States and really even throughout the world yeah. with, I mean, cats are one of the number, you know, top three invasive species, you know, for the impact they have on the environment, at least right. for mammals. Um, you know, with rats and goats also being mm -hmm. up there because they do just such, you know, huge devastation to population oh, yeah. numbers. Um, yeah, I and, know that there was yeah. a study where they like you know put uh, a camera um, 
on like cams? their cat. Yeah, and to yeah. see everything that it was that they were going and capturing, it was just like an insane amount. Like you just like don't realize how much your cute little fluff ball of a cat comes back because it's not just like the stuff that they bring back to your doorstep. There's other things that they're eating and capturing and, you know, they might not always kill it, but they're, you know, out there harassing them and stuff. So yeah. these animals are also getting stressed out, you know, from that, not just the yeah. simple like survival numbers. It's just, you yeah. know. And just their yeah. presence there. There was a great paper mm-hmm. I read um, out of the UK that came out, I think, a couple years ago that looked at just the impact of a predator being in the area and how it caused the parents to feed less often. Mm-hmm. So if the they were making, you know, 10 trips per hour, they would actually depress that rate to like five trips. And what does right. that do for nestlings that need to eat all the time because they're like doubling and tripling in body size right. if they're not getting enough food? And, you know... You can't possibly measure that when you're just looking at what a cat brings home. Right, exactly. You know, but they would just measure the changes in behavior, the indirect mm-hmm. effects of predation. And, you know, it's something we're finally starting to get a hang on right. of with, you know, just video cameras have mm-hmm. totally changed the game, I think, when it comes to ecology. Right. And, yeah, I mean, speaking, like, to dogs, uh, there's a, a poster going up uh, later tonight. Uh, by, actually, I think she's a... Uh, um, got it up now because I think I just saw a tweet from her but uh, mm-hmm. Jordan Rudder uh, she does Great Lakes piping plumber mm-hmm. work and some of uh, the stuff that she's looking at is how dogs impact uh, these mm-hmm. uh, nest beaches of the plumbers mm-hmm. so I mean they're you know when you let your dog off the leash at a beach a lot of times they're gonna go start sniffing around and investigating mm-hmm. things and one of the things they're gonna investigate are these nests and so these endangered uh, birds that, which are around the Great Lakes, mm-hmm. you know, they've been on the danger list for I think 30 years now or something like that. It's, you know, a big impact is because of these dogs. And so they're mm-hmm. trying to see, you know, about having like, you know, dog mm-hmm. area specific, you know, beaches yeah. that, you know, they're on and helping to educate mm-hmm. these owners to, you know, yeah. beware of their animals, you know, mm-hmm. when it comes to wildlife. Yeah. And so I'm going to try to uh, hopefully get Jordan on Periscope uh, later this evening so we can talk to her more about that. But yeah, it's it's interesting like you when you hear like how they're impacting multiple different birds in different settings. Like you said, like, you know, like, see if you just go to a, a nature center for a walk and you have your dog, making sure that you keep it on the leash mm-hmm. so it's not going and harassing, you know, other animals. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, so you said that you did some of your work down in Honduras. So yeah. Tell us about that. I mean, that's, I yeah. always like to hear about people doing stuff like out of country and how that, you know, went. So. Yeah. So the way my PhD program is structured is you have to do two independent research projects okay. before you launch your PhD. Oh, you know, okay. it sort of gets you a sense of, you know, you go through the whole process quickly. You learn mm-hmm. hopefully what your, you know, common mistakes are going to be like, do you really hate data analysis? You know, right. what do you have to bribe yourself with to sit down and write? Mm-hmm. Um, it also gives you some skills and a sense of maybe what do you want to do before you really commit. Right. Um, and so I was actually invited to go work for Operation Malaysia, which is a British conservation organization, and I love their model. Okay. Um, they believe in conservation through education. The okay. Long-term um, conservation projects can be really hard to fund because they want paper, 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 paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what gets funded if you can turn out papers. Right. So the model they've used instead is funding conservation through education. Okay. And so they would bring school groups out, um, high school and college, and they would do the data collection under field scientists. So either people who had graduated with degrees in ornithology, ecology, or any of the other related disciplines, or people with higher level degrees, you know, masters, PhDs, postdocs, would run these data collection opportunities for the schools, come out and teach them. Okay. And the students would actually get hands-on experience being scientists. So it's oh, a great way to neat. see, is this what I want to do with my life? Am I okay with getting up at 5 a.m. in the jungle and trudging out there with, you know, right. the same breakfast day after day to get data? You know, yeah. can I do this? Is this going to be my life or am I going to hate myself? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the work I was doing um, with them. And so mm-hmm. the project in particular I was looking at was to analyze the effectiveness of the methods because the worst thing you want to do is design this whole project go out collect all your data and find out you didn't do it well yeah. because you can't go back out and redo it mm-hmm. so, yeah i saw yeah. Her, i had to throw away a whole weekend uh, mm-hmm. of data collection well i mean it's you know not that big of a deal when you think about like a weekend but for my field season that was you know a quarter to a fifth of my field season right there that i just wasted that year because yeah. i didn't do it right that first weekend and i was just like i, I wasn't crying and I wasn't on the verge of tears, mm-hmm. but I was like, 
very close to like you know losing it when I realized mm -hmm. like oh crap we just did all of that work and we might yeah. not be able to recover mm -hmm. in time and be able to like make up for it before the field season is yeah. done and so like you want to make sure you have that stuff right yeah. um, so the organization had done an initial analysis of their first year data and they made some recommendations which were never actually vetted. You no, know, they they were sensible, scientifically based recommendations for how to improve detections. Right. Um, you know, more point counts. You know, and fewer misnetting opportunities. So, and misnetting is great. You get the birds in the hand. You can get a sense of ma the number of males, the number of females, the number of juveniles. Anytime you recapture a bird, you can learn more about it. You can learn how long they live. Do they stay in the same territory? Did they move? You can look at the molting, how the birds lose their feathers, what pattern they come in, how often they lose them. Because with this being Central America, there's so little known about those birds. Mm -hmm. What we know in ornithology is really Northern Hemisphere ornithology. Okay. That, you know, there are species that we don't know what they eat. You know, we don't know exactly what their ranges are. We have a vague sense. So this work in Central America and South America is, you know, it's still frontier ornithology. For people who are looking for, you know, organismal based, you know, in the field work, go south. You know, okay. that's where those opportunities are. But you want to make sure you do them well. Mm -hmm. And so my work was to take the data from that field season, 2015, and see how well we did compared to the original method. Okay. And now that we have a 10 year species list, how many of those detections are we actually getting? Okay. And you know, so that's really what I've been working with. Um, we had point counts, which are really, you go to a point and you count the number of birds you hear within 10 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, and you walk a trail and you do the same points year after year. So okay. you have, it's standardized that way. Mm -hmm. And the mist nets, as I put, mentioned before, which are where you put up, you know, basically invisible nets that have pockets in them. So the bird flies, hits the net, and drops into a pocket. And they get a little tangled and you just go and you pop them out and you have a bird in the hand, you know worth two in the bush. Right. Yeah. And then the third piece that we added in were um, incidental records. Okay. And so those in the past are like, oh my god, I saw this really awesome bird. It was way up there. And you record it. Mm -hmm. But you don't really have a sense of how much effort went in. Okay. Um, and so it can be really hard to standardize that for a scientific paper. All right. So what we had done was we put any birding activities under that. So if you did birding outside of point counts and misnetting, it went in this category. Okay. And so we're lo I looked at those three methods to see how good are we, how accurate are we mm -hmm. in detecting all the different species there. Nice. Uh, so like the last thing I kind of want to talk to you about mm -hmm. is SciComm because obviously anybody who knows me and follows me on Twitter or any of the things I'm on knows how much I love SciComm and how much an advocate I am mm -hmm. for it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your experiences yeah. with science communication, um, mm -hmm. how it's helped you um, in your career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one, I mean, hello, you ended up on this. Like, yeah. We didn't know each other without the yeah. you know, SciComm at Twitter. So uh, can you tell us you know, a little bit about your experiences with science yeah. communication? I would say, at least the internet portion of it, I am new. So I'm still, I feel like more receiving rather okay. than giving. And so that's where the second Twitter handle comes in. The first one was my own personal one, and I used it for so many things before science communication. Okay. Um, and now I'm in a PhD, and one of the things I think is really important, as I mentioned before, is this connection with other people who are not scientists. Right. Uh, and so I've created a second Twitter handle to really help capture my work okay. in one place to help um, connect with people. Because one of the things I'd like to do is have citizen science effort in my project. Oh, yeah. I'm great. still working out what that's going to look like. Um, I had some level of it with my mm -hmm. preliminary study. Right. And just really seeing how do I bring non-scientists in, give them that experience. Mm -hmm. Because not everyone can go to Honduras. You right. Know? And the students who went loved it. But it's not enough only people who go to Honduras understand conservation. Mm -hmm. How do we understand it at home? Right, yeah, because you think of uh, mm -hmm. those kids who can't afford to go, yeah. and yeah. you know, you want to still be able to help them understand science and get mm -hmm. a good, right. you know, grasp of it, so that they, you know, when it comes time for us to like ask the public, hey, can you help yeah. us, you know, fund us, fund us, give me money, or, yeah, like one funding or two, like we want to try to push this policy through, and they're helping to vote mm -hmm. for it. They need to be able to yeah. understand why it's important for that to go through, and if they don't have that educational background to it, mm -hmm. 
we're SOL with, you know, even though we might, you know, have all the best data and everything, if we can't help them to understand it, it's not going to go anywhere, so. Yeah, and so I think I'm really doing this the other way. I'm start, I have the experience with, like, in-person science communication okay. with my non-formal and my, you know, K-12 through background, mm -hmm. and now I'm trying to connect and expand it online as well. Right. But, you know, it's like... So many of the people I've met here at the conference, for instance, mm -hmm. I know through Twitter, just connecting, right. getting feedback, you know, knowing I'm not alone, I think is one of the hugest aspects I can appreciate about Twitter. Right. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be at this conference if it wasn't for Twitter because uh, mm -hmm. two of the people that I'm really good friends with on Twitter, you know, are big, huge burgers and were big advocates for this conference and they kept getting mm -hmm. after me and saying, you need to come to this conference. I was like, no, 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 you know, I mm -hmm. go to other conferences, you know, I'm not really a birder, you know, I'm a wildlife ecologist and like, no, you do weird stuff, you need to come here. Mm -hmm. And because of their constant mm -hmm. harassment, no, I really appreciate it. You guys were great. Encouragement. You were talking, yes, encouragement to uh, come. It like, you know, it got me here and that's all because of two grad students I knew, you know, who were completely out of state, you know, I, at the time had never met in person, mm -hmm. you know, talking me into yeah. this. And it's like, I'm so glad mm -hmm. I'm here. Like, there's so much I'm amazing here stuff too. going on. <laughs> Thanks. But I mean, it's all just because of science communication through Twitter, the networking that you get mm -hmm. on Twitter and other forums with other mm -hmm. scientists. Like, I just can't promote it and champion it enough because it's so valuable. I mean, you have to like really have like a directed focus mm -hmm. with how you want to use it because you don't want to just be wasting your right. time on Twitter and you know. But if you can really have like a goal with what you want to get out of it, it is so valuable. Like we talk about mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a conference within your phone and it, like every day I feel like I've got all these people that I can network with and that's why we come to conferences mm -hmm. to be able to network. Like you know, be able to sit down yeah. face to face and be able to talk to people and that's the nice thing too with Twitter. When you get to know someone on Twitter mm -hmm. first, and then you meet them at the conference, it's so nice because you're already at like that little bit of ease with them. And it's mm -hmm. not like that perfect stranger, like, "Hey, how's it going?" Oh, yeah, which we did. We right. did that. Yeah, and so like it helps mm -hmm. you know ease that out, so that way when you see them, mm -hmm. it's like, "Hey, bud, how's it going?" You know, mm -hmm. I've known you for like a couple of years. Mm -hmm. now. We might not have never met in person, but right. you actually are getting to yeah. like have that connection that much more in force of what you already had and you know there's some people out there that have used Twitter to uh, make connections of where they've actually yeah. had papers published mm -hmm. which is amazing so I mean you could do that I mean with you wanting to do citizen science mm -hmm. that's such a great way to talk to the public I mean so many people are on Twitter watch periscopes mm -hmm. and things like that like think about like if you were to go out into the field with your phone and do live yeah. periscopes of oh, your field yeah. work, that'd be such a great way to like show people these amazing animals and mm -hmm. where they live and what it is that you're doing. It's, I mean, it's endless of mm -hmm. how you can really reach people because you can't always bring people, like you said, out to the field, mm -hmm. but these are ways that you could get them yeah. into the field with you virtually so they can understand what's going yeah. on. So, you know, there's one thing you said, and that I think it's important to realize that it's not binary. It's not you do science communication or you don't and right. you're not on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Like, you can be on Twitter and just absorb it, I think. Right. And that might be a really mm -hmm. good starting stage. Right. You know, for people like, oh, I don't really know if that's me. Mm -hmm. Try it out. Make a yeah. handle. It doesn't matter what your handle is. Change it mm -hmm. afterwards. Yeah. But get the feedback. Like, my first Twitter account, I just used to get news sources. Mm -hmm. I just put all the columnists I liked and all the papers I liked so I could just get news that I wanted to, you know, get quickly without going to tons of different sites. Mm -hmm. And then I expanded from there. And there is now here. Right. Yep. So, anything else we haven't really covered? Uh, do you guys have any questions out there you want to ask? Because otherwise we'll probably wrap mm -hmm. this up pretty soon. Because mm -hmm. we're, well, we love talking to you <laughs> and everything. And there's a whole bunch of other talks and everything going on. And we want to get in and see all that fresh mm -hmm. science. You know, that's the best thing about conferences. You get to see science. like Cutting edge. Fresh. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's like. Some of these people like just came in from the field like three or four weeks ago and are throwing up their presentations mm -hmm. for us to see. So I mean, this is the stuff that you get to see before it gets released out into mm -hmm. journals, which is amazing. So this is like fresh science that's happening right now. So mm -hmm. we're gonna try to like go catch some of it later. Um, 
But yeah, if you guys don't have any uh, questions, um, I'm going to plug the next Periscope, uh, which is with uh, Aria Fournier. She's going to be talking about rails in Missouri. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, rails, uh, usually you'll find them in wetlands there. So you're going to get to see a lot of cool stuff that she's doing uh, with her rail work. Um, uh, amazing stuff. If you find her um, on Twitter, she's huge on Twitter, uh, Rally Rule. Um, it's her Twitter handle, like, so definitely mm -hmm. uh, tune in. I'll be at 5.45 uh, p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. 4.45. Oh, yeah. Oh, I said 5.45. Oh, yes. See, Hour that's, earlier. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's the thing with uh, conferences. You get a um, very, very little <laughs> sleep, so it's um, it's just standard. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. So, yes, 4.45. She's the last talk of the day in her session, so tune in. We will be periscoping mm -hmm. uh, that live. And then we're also going to try to do the poster session uh, later tonight as well. So we'll try to get a whole bunch of uh, different uh, posters, uh, highlight those, and do little short segments with them. And you guys can see all of the really cool research. So um, with that, if you don't have anything else, we're good. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any questions uh, coming in. I'm going to throw this back up again. So these are our Twitter handles. So if you want to be able to uh, take a screenshot of that, I'm wildlifebiogal.com. Kathleen is... Catetarian and Woodcock Watch, New Jersey. Yeah. And, and that's NJ, not spelled out. Oh, okay. And then if you want to be able to watch all of this later, go to wildlifebiogal.com. Uh, you'll be able to see it on Periscope. And then uh, when I get a chance, uh, probably after the conference, I'll put it up on YouTube. And also, um, I'll make a podcast out of it to put up on SoundCloud. So, but with that, I hope you guys have a good uh, rest of the afternoon. If you want to, uh, tune in for the other Periscopes that will be happening. I'll make sure uh, to make announcements about those on my uh, Twitter handle. And other than that, have fun and uh, go out and do some birding. So, enjoy. And then hopefully we'll see you on Twitter. Yes, exactly. All right. See you guys. Bye.